Hi, everybody. I'm Shilpini Yogi, and I am just really excited to welcome you all to the panel that's going to take on the question, is voice the killer app of education? Uh, I work with a company called Analytic Measures, where we're building new tools for using AI and automated speech recognition for learners of all ages, early readers, language learners, as well as job seekers. And I'm really excited to be with the panel today with four really dynamic CEOs who are not only using voice technology in innovative new ways to sort of rethink what learning can look like, but they're also bringing very different business models to the fore and serving learners of different ages. And we even have a global perspective. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground with the four folks I'm with. To kick us off, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to talk a little bit about the very specific application of voice technology that they're working on and to start to share their perspective on this question about is voice really the killer app of education. So to kick us off, Warren, why don't you take us to what Hi, you I'm Warren Schaefer. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of a company called Knowable. We've been around for about a year, so fairly new company. Noble is an audio first learning platform and we're focused on post-college learners. So I'm coming at the question from the perspective of people who have already had education um, and, and are actually adults. And we're probably the least technical in terms of the, the other uh, companies on the platform um, or on the panel rather, um, in that we're really focused on how do we reach consumers today with, with audio and with voice. Um, voice technology in many ways, the interactivity component is still in its nascent stages. So our hope is that, my hope is that I'll be working with some of the other panelists um, down the road in terms of incorporating the technology that they're working on to make audio learning content more accessible and engaging and personalized. Um, to answer the quick question of, do we think that um, voice is the killer app of education? Um, from my lens, for, which is post-college, uh, the answer is, is a no. Um, I, education already is um, out and about. Um, we think that audio and voice certainly supplements it um, education, um, I do believe, is a killer app to um, driving more engagement, though, with, with voice and audio. Thanks, Warren. Trish, do you want to talk next? Yeah, sure. Uh, so um, my name is uh, Trish Skillen. I'm the founder and CEO of Soapbox Labs. Um, so I'm a different perspective. I'm an engineer. I have a PhD in speech recognition. So I've been in the space of speech recognition, voice technology, AI for over 20 years now. So um, seven years ago, actually, we're going seven years now. So I left, I've been working in places like IBM Research and Bell Labs in voice technology, and I left Bell Labs to found Soapbox Labs. And our mission is very specific. It's around, we build voice tech for kids. We don't build anything else. We don't build the end user product. Uh, we license our technology and we partner with clients across the spectrum of education. So that's for, uh, practice uh, using voice technology to practice reading, to do um, screening for dyslexia, for doing formative and summative assessment for literacy and English language learning. And we also have experience across the toys and robotics market as well. So we've seen how kids interact with technology over the past seven years in a lot of different ways, um, particularly around play and in education. So it's kind of a unique perspective. So what we do is try and we customize, we work with our clients to customize our solutions while delivering really high accuracy and privacy based solutions. So, you know, I think it's interesting. The question you, you, you framed there was, you know, is this the killer app? I mean, for somebody who worked for 20 years in technology, I'm going to have to say yes. <laughs> but I really do believe this It's not like the area of speech recognition has been going on like 50 years. Um, you know, I've been in it 20 years, but there's, you know, as far back about 25 years ago, they were working, people, people were striving to be able to bring voice technology for literacy, for education, but the accuracy was just never there. You know, so it was a novelty. So I think the step change that we can bring to literacy and English language learning, I think it's huge. Um, I think it's only realizable now with very high accuracy systems um, and systems that, you know, can bring low false positives, low false negatives, do what we expect now from technology, uh, from speech recognition, but do for kids. 
Um, and, and I think I think it's 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 sinking in. I think it's people are absorbing it. I've, we see huge excitement across all different clients um, in all those different even speech therapy and you know all these different areas. So I think it will. I think it's really early days. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, speaking of English language learning, Ivan. Hey, uh, my name is Ivan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Body AI. And uh, we help children to learn speaking English as a foreign language by talking with a virtual cartoon character. Oh, I can show it uh, in a mobile app, just as they would with a human tutor over over Zoom, let's say. Uh, we work directly with, uh, with families, uh, mostly with children four to 10 years old in countries like uh, like Mexico, uh, Spain, Russia, Poland. And in the field where we are working, voice is definitely a killer app because uh, before voice, uh, it was, wasn't just possible to, to do. So there is this huge educational problem in the world, which is like a lack of speaking practice, like half a billion children learn to speak English in the world today. And uh, so far, their only like good option to practice speaking was through human tutors. But they charge like $20 per lesson, which is, you know, just too expensive for most families, right? And uh, anyway, so there are just not enough human tutors for uh, half a billion learners, right? And so we believe that with voice technology and AI, we can really solve this problem at scale. And yeah, and I hope like our children will be able to speak with each other. That's terrific. And Mark, batting cleanup. Great, well, thanks. Uh, so I'm Mark Angel. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and CEO at Amira Learning. Amira is the first software that uh, lets Young students, usually K to three, read out loud, uh, assesses their mastery as they read, and then delivers really uh, personalized one-to-one -one tutoring, kind of in that moment uh, uh, when a student is struggling and needs help. So Amir has been around for a couple of years. Our investors' partners include Google, Amazon, GSV, H&H. Uh, &H. Uh, we're pretty privileged to uh, already work with hundreds of districts across the country and to uh, serve uh, several hundred thousand K-3 students. I think our view about voice is, is that one, it's going to be ubiquitous uh, as part of the uh, ed tech landscape. It would be surprising given that if you go into any classroom, uh, what you hear more than anything else or children and teachers talking, if technology could really fulfill its ultimate role without being able to play a part in that conversation. But at the same time, we kind of tend to see voice as one aspect of the bigger revolution around machine learning and AI. And our kind of experience has been that uh, voice is a uh, uh, machine learning, uh, that uh, it's uh, uh, ultimately driven uh, by the AI revolution, but that to create ed tech apps that are really gonna be profoundly changing uh, it'll be about using AI in uh, a number of different forms and a number of different ways. And one of those ways is voice. So um, Trish, given your uh, background on the research side of it and looking at um, AI and machine learning and then back to voice and speech, um, what do you think of that? What do you think about the point that, that Mark raises and, and that also uh, Ivan spoke a little bit about, about sort of bringing different technologies together uh, and the power of voice kind of coming out more in conjunction with those technologies uh, versus kind of the power of voice itself? Um, I think people are, think about voice we can think about it a little more generally i like to think about it in that it's um an interface technology and how it's going to um be able to replicate what humans do so yes i do believe that you can add more ai on top of the outputs of speech recognition but let's say first there's very powerful things that a, a voice technology on its own can do i mean it can 
enable 10 years of research into dyslexia screeners uh, to automate it and put into a fun, playful app that kids can use. It can enable straight up right now without any extra AI on it, do a practice for kids, allow them to have 20 minutes a day practice with um, uh, a, 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 usually quite an engaging app, what we're seeing with our clients and with everything that's been brought to market on top of formative assessment. So what we're trying to do is just do what the teachers don't have time to do. Do what we don't have, the teachers don't have, aren't given enough resources to do in the classroom. Give what our teachers, all the parents sitting at home with their kids homeschooling them. We do, it needs a human to sit there with them. And right now today, voice technology can allow the practice, the remote assessment, and catch kids before they fail. I mean, that's that's the power of it today. Yes, there's tons of, of potential down the line, but, I, but I'm, I'm very much, I've always worked on the future uh, technologies, but I'm really excited about what's possible today. Because the accuracy is here, it's here right now. Uh, and we're seeing a huge acceleration in the amount of adoption in being able to bring these technologies to market this year, next year, you know, I mean, that's exciting as well. So one of the things um, I'd love to sort of talk to each of you about and, and have you guys kind of uh, um, maybe offer us a few different perspectives is given the fact that this is such an emerging technology, um, but we're already seeing in just the examples you shared and I know from some of the work uh, we're doing at, at Analytic Measures, um, automated learning tools, more engagement for students, more engagement for learners, regardless of whether they're adults you're using to your point were in a more straightforward application right i put on my headphones and i can go and i'm learning um but how are you all thinking about this issue of kind of access right how do people access how much access do people really have to these technologies we've all seen the articles um in the wake of COVID of both the explosion of remote learning but also the challenges that that sets forth um, so I'd be curious about how you all are thinking about sort of the access issue and in that context, the kind of um, quality of the experience, right? The, 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 the sort of reliability of the technology and the quality of the experience. Um, Warren, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Because as you noted, you're, you're at sort of a different end of the spectrum. Yeah, I think straightforward <clears throat> is, a, is a good word for how we're thinking about today, the application today, because we are a consumer facing platform. And just to recap, we're audio first learning. So a simple way to think of us is masterclass, but for audio first. And in terms of accessibility, we know that uh, a large percentage of the world's population doesn't have access to, to high internet bandwidth. Um, audio is something, one of the appeals of audio is that it requires much less bandwidth. And so I'm personally bullish and the company is bullish on this idea that audio expands opportunities for people to learn who don't have access to, you know, high streaming, high definition video um, today. Mark, how are you guys thinking about it with the mirror learning and particularly in the context of working yeah. with your So, so first, uh, I think Warren hit the nail on the head in saying that audio doesn't really raise the bar on the equity or access issue. There is a profound problem in that too many kids just don't have foundational access to the internet. And we work with districts that have been struggling now for months uh, just to find some mechanism to enable kids to have uh, remote learning as a possibility. Uh, but once you kind of solve that uh, level one uh, access and infrastructure issue, uh, audio can and voice can really uh, be a bit of an equalizer and can uh, enable uh, kids to have a richer uh, and more diverse experience in a remote learning environment. I do think the one thing we found, not, not very shockingly, is, is that there are requirements for a Zoom classroom or a Blue Jeans classroom uh, that are pretty unique and different and that uh, where we've often relied on tricks and approaches around headsets that when you're in a home environment, the kind of background noise, the kind of distractions, the kinds of issues that come up uh, uh, require yet another iteration and how to make uh, voice really work. Ivan? Uh I'd say that providing access to this speaking practice uh, is, you know, our mission is that's what we're doing. Like, imagine the alternative to what we are building is paying like $20, $60 per, per week. 
um, and like almost anyone today, you know, have some access to, uh, you know, have a mobile device, at least one mobile device per family. And if you have a mobile device and if you have some connectivity, you can learn, you can practice your spoken English using using our product, using Buddy. And uh, yeah, it's basically it, this vision is uh, is also in our like technology f uh, foundation that we built and uh, we can work with a pretty limited bandwidth. So yeah, I think it's a very important thing to, to, to work with it. That's what we are doing. Trish, is there anything you'd add in how we kind of think about this whole issue of, of equity and access? Yeah, I mean, we've been, you know, one of the things we've always strove for when we designed a system like this, and I think needs to be paid attention, any artificial intelligence, machine learning, voice technology system, is having it work for the real world, having it work for today's environments and children, and ensuring there isn't, um, you know, bias in the technology, because there was a very well publicized a New York Times piece when it showed that speech recognition technology had shown bias between black and white users. And like, you know, that's devastating, you know, to realize when you want to look at that in education, if you were to have bias in, in, in voice technology and education, um, that's detrimental to, to be less accurate for a certain demographic, whether they're black and white, whether Latino, whether they're socioeconomic backgrounds, so what, what we did was actually work for the last 18 months with the Florida Center for Reading Research, uh, Dr. Yakov Petcher, they're their group, um, and they've just finished studies to be able to demonstrate there's a strong consistency with the technology, our technology and human assessors, and no bias for any of those groups. And I think that's something as a whole, as, as an industry, we'll have to work towards to make sure, well, like, we've worked hard on it, but this, this something needs to be, and I mean in, image processing, any AI, even in the data analytics that we're going to layer on top of voice technology, that we have to be mindful that when we do this, that it's done, it, 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 these studies are done first before the technology is brought to market and make sure that we're not going to introduce, because the worst thing in the world, we bring it in because of cost, we bring it in because of COVID, we bring it in because we need remote learning, um, and we bring it in too quickly and it isn't serving the, a fairness in the population. And I think that's critical um for for the industry to, to be valid and to, to get credibility with the teachers and the parents and, and the districts yeah and i think that you know um just from my background being 20 plus years not only in education but very closely in the world where you think about assessment and measures and how do we make sure that um we're not introducing bias and trying to really capture how well somebody knows or can do something or where they need intervention or help, uh, it does seem to me that the, the level of error or kind of messiness you can accept or tolerate uh, in a consumer setting is actually probably greater in some ways in this instance than it is when you think about it's my kid and they're learning to read or they're learning a new set of skills. Um, and the learning context and the sort of threshold for what we expect in terms of quality and fairness, I think is actually a much higher threshold and there's much greater sensitivity when you're talking about um, learners of all ages, but particularly children. And I do think that this actually could be a place where um, all of us who are working in this field can push the envelope and kind of actually bring a framework for how we think about equity that we've done in other aspects of educational research because I do think the tolerance uh, for disruptive technology and consumer world is very different uh, than, than what it is when you're really talking about the classroom regardless of whether the classroom um, is remote or face to face. Yeah you don't want to lose trust of people who are adopting this disruptive technology so I think it's important to bring everybody along with us in this like yeah for sure um th this also raises for me a question i'd be curious from all of your perspectives what you think some of the myths or misconceptions are both about um where ai and automated speech recognition and voice technology um is going or what's possible now 
both, and I mean that both from a positive and um, what we should be wary of, but what's the potential maybe that we're not seeing or what are things that people might think of in fairly simplistic ways, but, but, but we should have some cautions. Um, Mark, I see you nodding, so you're gonna get the question first. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, one kind of myth is, is that the future of voice is going to play out in the context of our experience with voice applications like Alexa and the Google Assistant. Uh, what we've tended to uh, see so far uh, as kind of individual consumers of voice applications are very stilted uh, kinds of one-to-one -one things where you literally have to say, hey, Alexa, listen to me, and now uh, I'm going to talk to you for 30 seconds, and uh, you have that kind of uh, laser focus uh, uh, interaction. Where we're going to head uh, is towards a conversational dynamic where uh, the voice application is just another participant in the human dynamic. And you're already seeing that. Uh, Amazon announced this week that uh, they're going to add much richer conversational capabilities to Alexa. And I think that uh, uh, the big uh, sea change for us as uh, users of voice apps is to migrate from that point-to-point uh, -point interface to a, a group dynamic of which the, uh, the application is one voice in the orchestra. What do you think, Ivan? I, I don't believe that uh, the future of voice equals future of uh, smart speakers or even voice assistants. Uh, so first of all, this uh, like ecosystems created by Google and Alexa uh, limits the you know the capabilities of developers a lot. So basically, we wouldn't be able to do uh, to build our product on uh, on Alexa or uh, Google's devices, and we had to develop our our proprietary speech stack because we uh, you know have to work with visuals in. Uh, in combination with voice, we we want to. Uh, so we're working with pronunciation as well as understanding, uh, you know, speech and and process and and like managing dialogues. So if uh, Amazon and Google would give us uh, would give developers access to like full uh, uh, to unlock the full potential of these devices, for instance, uh, you know, it would be a much like I think every everybody would win. Like, and uh, first of all, the users because it's a in, in the end, Amazon Echo is is a computer, right? But we have access to only like a small fraction of of its capabilities as developers, as engineers and designers today. Yeah, I'm not the right person to speak on behalf of of Google and Amazon, but uh, uh, I think the challenge that Ivan is raising is, is that they have a really profound conundrum around making full access available because oftentimes that means making the direct uh, audio available and that's exactly when they run into the firestorm of privacy and uh, uh, protection issues that we're all pretty concerned about and familiar with. So. Uh, I think one way this may play out is for the Googles and Amazons to create really rich layers of services. Uh, this is their business anyway, whether it's Google Cloud or AWS. And I think what we're already seeing is that they're going to decompose that uh, kind of direct access to voice into uh, AI-driven bits and bytes that applications can kind of consume as a secondary basis. And there's always going to be a lag between what they can do and what they're the rest of the world can do because of the concerns they're going to have about privacy and access. Well, given the fact that you have a more consumer perspective on this, I'd love to hear kind of what you think, both in terms of the myths, but also the evolving ecosystem. Yeah, it's definitely early innings for interactivity and voice, and it's very frustrating. I think what Ivan is alluding to is, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, developers can't have an interactive experience today with Alexa speakers or, or Google speakers. And those speakers now, as the summary of this panel called out, over half of US households have a smart speaker in their home. And yet developers haven't really been able to build something that is interactive because Google and Amazon are rightfully concerned about privacy. Um, and so I think they will get better at that. Um, 
they will find ways to build trusted relationships with developers. And that's when we'll see that proliferation of two-way interaction that just doesn't really exist today, right? When think, people think of smart speakers today, they think, I want to call an Uber, I want to play some music, or maybe my kid can talk to Google, right? Um, and that's, that's sort of where we're at. So for us as a consumer facing company, you know, first, first inning is people learning through audio. Um, but the second version of that is people interacting with the content that they're learning through, right? So already having that screen free environment and building on top of it is, uh, is where, where I think things are going. And, and I think probably everyone else on this panel does too. Trish, I'm going to have, let you have the last word here, uh, as our, uh, scientist here sitting sort of looking <laughs> this with a longer view um yeah i mean look there's a there's a lot where voice technology is today and i'll just speak very briefly to the google um the alexa idea is what they try and do is to estimate what we're, what you're trying to say based on you know the needs of uh, of a voice assistant how it delivers your you know, under being a, being your assistant that is a use case of, of voice technology um where we want to go with this is to be able to allow natural interactions like we shouldn't have to think about how we're going to sit or sit up straighten up think about how we want to get the best uh, response from alexa or google we just want to be able to talk naturally as kids do right so that's what kids do and they, it's a joyful thing to watch how they interact with technology technology needs to work with kids how they work in their environments and their naturalness rather than expecting them to conform to a technology that was built by engineers for adults you know and that's where it will never work it will always hit hit a ceiling unless we address the problem specifically for children and when we're talking about in our classrooms on apps on computers we have to think about how the child needs to use this voice technology to better their education, not just taking a technology off the shelf and shoehorn it into an educational product and expecting it to work. It will always hit a, 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 a you know, a ceiling in accuracy. And, and that's, i sorry, as a scientist, I get so frustrated yeah. because I, I think people believe that is the height of what voice technology and speech recognition technology can get to, and it's not, it's not even close. It's just a technology that's serving a different end. So where it can go, um, is fantastic and the opportunities um, there for kids and, and education is, is, is amazing and I'm you know I'm excited to be part of it and I, I think everybody else here is as well. So I want to start sharing some of the questions that are coming in. Uh, the first question we got is about um, students with disabilities and particularly as we're talking about voice technology and speaking and listening uh, is this going to be something that's prohibitive for students who are deaf or mute? Uh, and how do we need to kind of think about that? I, I don't know, Trish, if you want to talk a little bit about how that's sort of thought about in the science and technology and then, you know, other panelists as well. But the question is very specifically around how we think about addressing um, the issues for students with disabilities, particularly students who are deaf and mute. Yeah, I mean, for disabilities in general, it's an ex I look at it as an accessibility, um, an opportunity to be able to use so with physical disabilities, to be able to use your voice. And, and what we hear a lot of the, is that kids, uh, there's a lot of technologies out there that do dictation, that do transcription, that do that, but they do it for adults. They start to work really poorly for, for kids the younger they get. And that's really key. The voice technology can start for kids, can start to work, to, whether it's for dyslexia or whatever, or disability. When it comes to, to kids who are deaf and mute, there are um, companies out there that will actually build um, and tune models specifically to the child. Um, I, I, you'd have to Google it now. I'm trying to think of the name of them. Voice ITT, I think the names. Um, I mean, you know, there are, and it, it's a fantastic mission that they have is to be able to serve that. So because what will happen with deaf and hard of hearing is that the voice won't be as as clear and articulate even as, as some other children, even though there is great variability in kids speech, they have an extra challenge in that. Um, so for other, for unfortunately for, for those kids, it's a huge challenge for other kids with disabilities. It's a huge opportunity uh, to be able to open up um, interfaces for them. Mark, yeah. Yeah. Chime in on that. I think uh, I'll agree with Trish on the last point, which is that uh, when you look at accessibility as a holistic problem, what you see is is that uh, uh, an interface modality that helps one uh, kind of child 
is absolutely useless and devastatingly inequitable for another class. And it's really why we believe that voice needs to be seen as part of a, a comprehensive application interface. And so uh, Amira, for example, presents not just as a uh, bodiless, soulless uh, voice coming out of the wilderness the way that Alexa does, but uh, as a three-dimensional uh, tutor with a visible screen. And it's that comprehensive UI that allows us to address accessibility issues and all kinds of other issues using the full arsenal of what uh, software is about today. Uh, and so uh, we'll just say this is a great yeah. example of why voice ought to be considered a tool in building a great comprehensive interface as opposed to something that stands alone. So a couple of more questions that we're getting. Um, I'm going to tee up a couple of them and then sort of just go around to different folks on our panel. Uh, one of the questions is actually uh, taking a step back and asking, um, how do you know whether the systems are really um, able to address different types of pronunciation, uh, different dialects, um, both in terms of just regular usage with the voice tech, but also if you start to recognize or diagnose particular challenges, um, how do you kind of, I, I think what the question is trying to get at is, how do you sort of know that you're giving people the right feedback and not miscues, right? So how are you sort of distinguishing from someone actually having speaking or um, listening difficulties versus you're actually able to respond to a range of pronunciation and dialects? Uh, any volunteers for the question or? Um, I, I can tell you how the study was done in uh, what we did with Florida uh, Center for Reading Research. It, it's basically done with human assessors, right? So very importantly, when it comes, people often think about, um, oh, we got to address accents. You know, we don't just have to address accents, we have to address dialects as well. And I think maybe that's a little bit to the, the, the question um, that was asked there. Um, how do you do that? You have to get human assessors, uh, experts to be able to annotate the data data, a test set of data, and be able to say that um, that way that child answered that question or that pronunciation, it may not be um, acceptable for some assessors, they may mark that wrong, but you have to have some training involved in the assessors to be able to say what is the correct pronunciation, what dialect variations should be acceptable. So what we did was to work with a crowd of experts, because when you're a technologist, I don't know if anybody else here in the panel, I'm not an expert in, in, in evaluation and literacy evaluation, but the key is to work with the people who are the experts they are. They come up with these tests to be able to assess, is it is it bias against an accent? Is it bias against a particular dialect? And then to ensure that that's not getting out into the world and into the the, the classrooms. Um, and if it if it is, it need, we need to address it. Um, that's not so. What what happens is is usually to first of all assess it against human assessors, and then to ensure that the scoring is the same. Because what happens often is there is variability between assessors themselves, and it can be quite significant. And a lot of bias actually happens in humans. Inter interrater variability is huge, and it can be up to 15 18 percent i think in some areas that it depends which assessor you're getting what mark you're getting you know so that shouldn't happen so there is an opportunity for speech recognition to be objective possibly more objective um, than human assessor and that is the power potentially in this if it's built right um and i think i hope that answers the question but maybe yeah, something else. i, I, I yep. think that does answer a lot of it i don't know if mark or ivan have anything to add you we, have, the, just, yeah, yeah, go ahead uh, yeah, just as Trish said, so we are doing testing in, in each country we are, we are present, in each language zone. So now we serve three language zones, Spanish, Polish, Russian, and just launching Turkish. And we just do excessive testing with human assessors, as Trish said, in, in each market. So that's the only way. Yeah, the, the only thing I'll add is this is a, a great example of why voice is... Uh, uh, best understood in the context of machine learning. Uh, the way the technology gets smart is to uh, uh, construct its understanding against human supervision. And to the degree that uh, you have masses and masses of human supervision, the technology will increasingly replicate the judgments and outcomes that humans make. And as Trisha said, to the degree that you have variability, 
uh, about human judgment and the supervision that goes into the system, uh, then the algorithm is going to reflect those inputs. So if we want uh, uh, voice systems that uh, understand accents and dialects and uh, behave as we would hope and expect them to, there's only one cure, which is masses of amounts of data that are representative of the supervised input that we expect uh, uh, the, the system to kind of judge. And I think this whole topic kind of um, reinforces the earlier piece around developing applications of speech recognition that are very specific to particular learning use cases and particular learners in the context, right? It, it goes back to even that issue of the consumer technologies or the ecosystems built for Google or Alexa are looking at a very different use case and a very different um, definition of utility versus when we're talking about learning and assessing and, and helping people actually um, improve their skills over time, right? And, and what's the fidelity of that experience and implementation? Yeah, um, I, I don't want to, Shelby, I don't want to speak for Ivan, but I'm going to guess that even within the narrow range of what a mispronunciation application is doing, students are going to be different than, for example, whether a student read a word correctly or not. Uh, the of course. The we work with would say, uh, look, um, uh, it's, it's potentially a okay if a student with a, a Hispanic accent reads a word a certain way, as long as they're evidencing that they understand uh, how to read that word. But if you're trying to get that student to pronounce it uh, in a way that corresponds to the best possible English, you might say, well, that isn't quite right. So I think your point about uh, the models have to really reflect the intent and purpose of the application is dead on. Uh, we just got a question that I'm going to actually read explicitly because uh, I don't want to get this uh, wrong. So the question asks that given the low worldwide literacy rates, how do you think audio tech will play out in the future of leading, reading literacy? I know some of you are using it to help children learn to read, but you also need to consider the alternative that most do not learn to be proficient. What do we do then? So I'd say that there are multiple solutions in the world today to address this issue. You know, voice helps you to solve like a certain issues, like for instance, speaking practice, that's what we are doing. But it also can help you with reading, uh, like, like the, the Marx company, right? So as you said, uh, Shilpi, so we are solving a very specific yeah. uh problems here right do you guys think voice is going to become um just more naturally the kind of dominant modality because i think if there is this sort of tension right that there is aspects of it trish as you noted that are very natural to human interaction but then it does raise these questions about um does it play out for accessibility the same way for all populations, right? So there's kind of an inherent tension. I, I am curious how dominant you think that this modality or this technology becomes um, as we look out even two to three years. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the question will be around accessibility to the devices and to the internet connectivity. One of the things we're very focused on is taking the technology off out of the cloud and onto devices and onto embedded chips um, that can actually be used cheaply and, and, and have wide proliferation in markets that don't have accessible, you know, internet connection, that don't have uh, expensive devices. Um, you know, there was this talk some time ago about, you know, the the five twenty dollar smartphone and that was going to be rolled out in India. Um, so I think we have to be very mindful of how we build this technology. Um, I think it's really powerful. I think if somebody can't read, you can have text to speech to actually read in an accessibility way. I think voice is more powerful than just the recognition part. I think there's yeah. a lot more to it than that. Uh, there's a whole cycle of of translation, real time translation. It's it's powerful in a lot of different ways. We have to work really hard towards. Um, 
being mindful of being three years, five years out, what's the technology? It's not a case that we're all going to have internet access, in, especially right. in people who really need it in the developing world. So what else can we do? Can we make devices cheaper? Can we get voices onto low cost chips that can be embedded into these? Can we, you know, can we do other things to help people to, to you know, break it, break it, use technology in ways that can help them in their lives like you know um i think it's possible i think the world is, we, we just again as an industry as a from a speech recognition industry i think we need to be mindful of of the future and and not everybody it's it's not a case of we're all going to have very powerful smartphones yeah. 5g in five years that's not true right. um, and be mindful of that so um as we're kind of getting close to the end of our panel i want to make sure we have time uh for uh, a little more of sort of um learning about what you all are learning about learners, right? As you're doing this work and engaging learners of different ages and in different contexts, uh, what insights are you getting into either how people learn, what their needs are? I'll let you answer that um, as as, uh, as you see fit from, from, from your uh, perch on this question. Warren, let's kick it off with you. Sure. I, I want to share a statistic, which is that <clears throat> approximately 100 million Americans are now listening to podcasts on a monthly basis. And, and we're really seeing this spike in, in usage. And the number one reason that people say they listen to podcasts today is that they want to learn new things. And so my company, Knowable, you know, what, what we're really building is the platform for good for you audio. This idea of if you want to learn something through audio, there's no dedicated place for that today. <clears throat> and that's what we're building. Um, and so I think there's a very near term application of voice and audio that is missing in the education sphere, even, even at this first inning of interactivity. Um, and what, what I've learned from, from our early customers to date is many people who are coming to us are lifelong learners already, and they're very busy. And so audio is a way that helps people fit learning into their lives. Uh, and that ultimately is, is our mission to unlock learning time for more people. So um, I think that there's a really powerful, <clears throat> going back to this, you know, what is the question that we're trying to answer here? Um, I, I, do think, I do see audio as being a very powerful uh, driver of education um, and voice long term as well. Thanks. Ivan? So, like, we do a lot of user interviews. Uh, and uh, what we often hear here is that, uh, you know, it's like it's a magic for parents to hear their children speak English with this like a virtual character. And some of them, some of these children uh, are, you know, speaking English for the first time in their lives with, you know, with our character. So that's basically our like main motivator. And uh, our, the, our parents of our students say that Buddy made their children interested in learning English after uh, like after nothing uh, other things didn't work like mm -hmm. including classes tutors and things like that because for children it's also magic uh, you know so basically buddy is probably you know like maybe it's the only uh fictional cartoonish character with which you can really speak you know uh in in, in today's world and they 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 build this like emotional connection yeah. which creates engagement and accountability and helps them to start speaking, which is, you know, great yeah. for them and for, for their parents. That's wonderful. Mark? Yeah, I think what we've learned is, is that when we...